I have a slight suspicion that this video has the potential to upset people, especially if among those of you who are watching, there are some who see me as some sort of a spokesperson uh, for per your particular creed, especially among Catholics, because that is who my channel is heavily catered to, um, that you might see within this admission that I'm going to make in this video, um, something that shouldn't be admitted for someone who who is that stand-in or, or a focal point or a spokesperson for a particular creed. Um, so I wanted to take a moment at least to describe what I think my purpose is in, in publishing this content and what I think the focus of my channel is. I, I published in the past a video about why you shouldn't listen to me. And I've been tempted to do another one just as a reminder, but perhaps to, to build in a little bit more about why I think that that's true insofar as what I mean by it. But maybe I'll just take this opportunity to describe a little bit more about where my thinking is uh, on this channel. And I'll start by saying that um, I don't consider myself a spokesperson for a creed or especially Catholicism. I'm certainly not a theologian. I'm not an authority. I have no office. I have no vested interest. I, I don't get money from any institutional framework within the church. I don't work for anybody. Um, this, this channel and this publishing effort is purely a labor of love for me and, uh, and of interest for me. I'm not even a philosopher by trade. Um, what I am is a thinking Catholic who is trying to apply this creed and to live it out. And as I do so, to refine it, to make sense of it, to revisit certain concepts and to reapply them if I'm struggling to make sense of them. Which is to say that it is a struggle. And that's okay if, if we experience struggle and anxiety as we are working out our faith, uh, as St. Paul says what we ought to do. We are the church militant, which is to say that we struggle, we should struggle, we should struggle with our own nature and against our own uh, concupiscence and uh, directedness towards patterns of behavior that do not lead to life, but lead away from it. This life, this moment, this temporary uh, state of being is about resolving that struggle and progressing towards something where we ought to progress. And if you're a Catholic and a Christian, you should understand that to be your salvation and then your perfection. So there is a certain degree of struggle that we should be prepared for and we shouldn't be surprised by. But if I'm being honest, I find myself struggling to a degree with which I have not experienced before. And I might have considered in the past to be beyond a threshold that I would have expected to be reasonable. Now, I'm not saying that uh, maybe those goalposts have been moved. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, that threshold has been crossed, but I'm surprised to to be in this position and to be struggling to the degree that I am. And I'll provide a, a little more context about this. For example, I will often tune in to my news app and, and scroll through some of the headlines and, and, and read some of the articles. And I have found myself in a position where lately, maybe the past couple of years, uh, it's hard to know exactly when, uh, when things shifted or if it's just been a gradual thing. But I find myself in a position now where when I scroll through those headlines and I read whatever articles I can read, uh, I find myself in opposition to just about everything I'm reading. As if the entire world has positioned itself in, in an antagonistic posture towards me and me to it. And that's, a, that's not a fun place to be in. And there is a certain point where you have to say, uh, if I'm the only person holding out certain beliefs and, uh, and I find that everyone else is in opposition to me, maybe I'm the crazy one. Maybe it's not the whole world that's crazy. Maybe it's me that's crazy. And I felt more and more like that uh, in recent years. And I've started to ask that question more and more. Now, as a, a side note, 
I don't think things are actually that bad. And I think I, I expect that a lot of people are actually feeling that way lately where they feel like the whole world is crowding around them, coercing them, manipulating them and expecting them to tow a particular belief or party line or philosophy. And I don't think that uh, I don't think that that's accurate. And we get glimpses of where most people are at these days. But the problem is that m a lot of us just aren't organized in being able to communicate that to each other, in part because those who exist in, and persist in positions of power, whether they be through communications or tech or government or whatever, uh, are preventing us from having those kinds of conversations. We're getting censored uh, systematically by the powerful. But there are moments where you can get a bit of a glimpse of where at least some groups of people are at. And for me, this has happened recently uh, on YouTube. I've noticed that uh, YouTube is now in the habit, uh, at least for my particular feed, of, uh, of rendering a news ribbon in the news, and especially as it relates to COVID, because this is a, an emergency situation and we all have to be attentive to it. I, I, I assume that's what the thinking would be there. And within that ribbon, it's only showing mainstream news channels. For me as a Canadian, that would include the CBC, Global News, and CTV News predominantly. And all of these videos feature that popular mainstream media narrative that also happens to align itself very enthusiastically with the government's narrative. And what I have felt like is the overwhelming popular belief that has been adopted out there, which has made me feel isolated because I'm not 100% on board with that. But if you click on any of these videos, and I, if I have time to edit this afterwards, I, I'll try to screenshot some of these for you. You'll notice that overwhelmingly, the reaction from among the people who are watching these videos is negative the like to dislike ratio is very much is weighed towards the dislikes like 90% or more in most of these cases, which isn't something you see very often on YouTube for an, a variety of reasons. For example, I'll use my channel. My channel is one in which uh, the algorithm recommends my content to people who have liked similar content, which means that I tend to get a lot of sympathetic viewers which means that it's very rare for me to have anything more than 10% dislikes on a video, even though I tend to adopt fairly controversial opinions, even as it relates to my base from time to time. But in the case of this news, in the news banner, this isn't something that's based on the algorithm. This is something that YouTube is obviously recommending for everyone to pay attention to, not based on what they have liked previously, but because this is of public concern. Therefore, those who are watching and reacting to it is about as close to a random sample as the population as YouTube could potentially provide for us. Now, obviously, that's not a scientific sample. It's not a, it's not an objective way to look at data or anything like that. It's just a glimpse of a pocket within the social conversation that is taking place right now. And I think it's telling, it's revealing. It's telling us something about what the authorities, those who are in positions of publishing power and controlling information, whether it be tech or the media themselves, who are collaborating in this case, they are editorializing a particular narrative by either selectively uh, promoting certain kinds of stories or content, or just by actually editorializing it, promoting a particular view about the information that they are conveying to us. And the reaction of the people interacting with that content, at least in this particular instance, is overwhelmingly negative. Now, as somebody who tends to sympathize with that reaction, that has been encouraging for me. All of which is to say that I don't think this feeling of isolation, antagonism, and opposition that I've been feeling is unique. I think that there are others out there feeling that way anyways. So I'm not entirely discouraged by, uh, by this sense and perception of what's going on out there. But it isn't just what's going on in the, in the world around us. It's also, in my experience, what's going on in the church these days. Uh, as someone who prefers and almost exclusively attends the Tridentine Mass, I find myself and many of the people who are, who are part of my community 
uh, we feel marginalized and isolated by maneuvers that have been made legally within the church, such as Pope Francis's document, uh, Tradici Traditionis Custodis, which isn't just a document. It actually legislates um, the marginalization of, of that particular liturgy and the communities that prefer it. And in my experience, uh, among many of the things, uh, not only that, that, that seem to be going on in the church, it's like you can't express any opposition to that without being accused of being unfaithful to the Pope or somehow un-Catholic. Which is just one more way that I personally feel uh, antagonized and in a posture of opposition to the popular occurrence. But in a much more poignant way because the church is my refuge. The church is the bride of Christ whom I love because I love our Lord. And who I have attached myself to in the hopes of being liberated from everything that holds me back from truth, goodness, and beauty, and from God himself. And so I rely very much on the church to be my refuge, to be my wellspring, to be my source of life and grace and help. And lately, I have found myself feeling less and less like that's true. And I'm afraid to admit that because... That is such a vulnerable thing that I know many people will take advantage of and exploit in the comments below saying, well, you should become Orthodox or Protestant or you should become, you should join our little schismatic group or this is why the Catholic Church is wrong or, or whatever. But can it be okay for me to just admit that without also saying, well, this is why I'm abandoning the church or my faith. I'm struggling and I'm struggling through these questions. And I think we need to be able to admit that from time to time. And considering the scope and nature of my channel, I think it's important for people like me who are pew-sitting Catholics to be able to admit that. Because I'm not a representative and I'm not an authority. I'm not a bishop. I'm not a clergyman. I'm just a guy trying to live this stuff out and being a critical thinker as I do. And as I not only think about it, but as I apply it to my life and I experience it and I test it. Recently, when I was at Mass, I had a moment where I was able to contemplate this in a way that I, I thought was quite profound. And this is one of the things that, um, if I can plug the Tridentine Liturgy for a second here, that I, I certainly love about it, which is that I found myself in a moment of contemplation, prayerful contemplation, which isn't something I set aside time for to do very often, which is, of course, my own fault. But in the Tridentine Liturgy, Based on its structure, it affords these kinds of opportunities for silence and prayer and contemplation. So not because of any great discipline or piety of my own, I just found myself in a scenario where I was silently, prayerfully contemplating some of these things. And this was after having received communion and I was kneeling in my pew watching a uh, father who was... Uh, laboring to to organize the implements of the sacrifice of the mass on the altar and to continue on with celebrating the liturgy and as i was watching him i was thinking i'm i'm tired of the fight i'm tired of feeling like i'm in opposition to so many people including even the magisterium based on how you interpret what's going on right now and i just want to i want to stop fighting I'm exhausted. I want to give up if there's a way out. And one of the ways out that occurred to me is that even though I consider, you know, on this question of liturgy, if I can focus on that for a second, even though I consider the Tridentine liturgy to be more beautiful, more transcendent, more mystical, more aligned with Catholic theology than the new form. In other words, I consider it to be much better in many respects, if not all respects, or at least the sum total of those respects. Does that mean that I'm entitled to it? Does that mean that it is my right and that I should assert that right? I, I was reminded in that moment of contemplation of something uh, Matt Frad, who I, res I deeply respect, 
said in one of his podcasts as he relayed a story about liturgy uh, in which he was having a conversation with, I believe, a priest that he knew and perhaps lamenting the same the same concerns or, or articulating the same concerns. And that priest saying to him, but Matt, you don't deserve the Tridentine liturgy. You don't deserve beautiful liturgy. You deserve hell, which I know is going to be jarring to a lot of people listening to this. But I happen to agree with him. I don't deserve the highest form of liturgy. I don't deserve the most beautiful uh, architecture or art or expressions or music or chant or, or whatever it is, the highest form of piety that might exist. It is a mercy that those things are given to me if I'm able to access them at all. And a lot of people aren't. So maybe versions of the liturgy or of Catholic piety that are performed in a particular way I don't consider remarkable or edifying to my, my, my particular faith, especially as I understand it. Maybe that's all, that's more than I deserve. And at the very least, it could be a penance for all the many things that I need to be contrite for that I have done in my own life. And that seemed like an out to me. And out from at least the fight. Because I always feel like I have to defend my reasons for going to the Tridentine liturgy or for asserting uh, traditional forms of Catholicism. Because so many people challenge me on that. And even if they don't explicitly, I often feel like I am being challenged on it uh, by the gossip that I hear about me from, from people that I know or things that are posted uh, in reply to uh, things I post on Facebook or, or YouTube or otherwise, I feel like I constantly have to be ready for a fight as opposed to being ready to explain the hope that is in me as St. Peter uh, implores us to do. And I remember when I first converted to the Catholic Church, I made a similar concession at the time because I was somebody who was very much immersed in fashionable currents of society at least aesthetic currents. I listened to certain kinds of music. I had achieved certain measures of success in what it means to be cool <laughs> uh, growing up. And when I became Catholic, that was actually one of the things that really turned me off about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, as it is expressed and as it is uh, celebrated culturally, as it expresses itself culturally today, uh, most certainly in the liturgy, is not cool. It's not interesting, it's not attractive for a millennial like me. It's quite lame, in fact. It's quite unattractive. The music, the outdated architecture, which is only outdated insofar as we started to decide that we were going to try to follow the trends of design and architecture. Anything pre-modern um, didn't succumb to that. And so isn't outdated at all. It's universal. It's classical. But most churches where I live do not derive benefit from, from those sensibilities. And they're mostly quite ugly churches, quite ugly buildings, quite ugly spaces. Ugliness being a, a distraction for those of us who are trying to worship beauty himself, which is God. And so I looked, I surveyed this landscape of what I... I understood to be Catholicism, and I said, that's okay. I'm going to swallow that bitter pill if it means that I can follow the truth. And I even, in moments of reckless abandon to this new faith and this new creed that I was adopting, I threw all my, my music, my all my albums away that I considered to be contrary to this to this, this new faith that I was adopting, both aesthetically and in terms of content. I, th I, I thought that this, this lame culture, this banal culture that I was embracing, was actually uh, what Catholicism is supposed to be, uh, because that's all I knew it to be. And anything that appeared 
in opposition to that, I thought, well, I have to discard these things. And so I did. That, that was a concession that I made. But the more I've immersed myself in the tradition of Catholicism, the more I've realized that what was actually a blip in the history of, of Catholicism, the way that liturgy and, and architecture and art and every all, all the cultural expressions of Catholicism today, that's not the depth of Catholicism. That's just a blip in history of what we could call 1960s or 70s sensibilities of renewal and reform to the culture of Catholicism in order to make it more appealing to the fashionable currents that existed at that time. But if you're really going to follow that sensibility and that mindset, you have to be in a constant state of renewing and reforming your culture so that it appeals to the culture that is around you because the, the culture that is around us is in a constant state of change and flux, chasing fashions and trends that are arbitrary. What precedes that in our heritage is a timeless, universal, and classical culture. And I didn't know that that could exist. And not only that, I didn't know it could be beautiful. It could be attractive to all sensibilities because it transcends fashions and trends. It doesn't cater to them. It doesn't chase them in a, in a way that where it's constantly behind the curve. So as I immersed myself more and more in that tradition, I started to discover that there is an attractive, beautiful version of Catholicism. We don't have to be confined to banal liturgy and banal culture. And one of the reasons that is so, such, the, that was such a difficult concession for me to make was because as I was embracing this experience of conversion, as I was becoming Catholic, I was also leaving behind, in a sense, people that I deeply love and care about, both family and friends, who were not journeying with me into this conversion experience. And the more I discovered the truth and the benefit that, that this, truth, this truth derived for me in my life, the more I wanted that benefit for them as well. But there were roadblocks to their conversion. In effect, I wanted to evangelize them. I wanted to welcome them in. But what I found was that the, um, the institution and the infrastructure uh, of the way that we communicate our faith was extremely unattractive to anybody who m might consider converting. Again, it's, it's from the outside looking in, this is a lame, very uncool, very unattractive culture even by 1970s standards, um, certainly by millennial standards. So for me to say, hey, why don't you come to this thing that my church is organizing or why don't you come to mass with me? I was always cognizant of the fact that <laughs> they were going to be coming to a thing that was just lame in appearance at least and in aesthetics at least. And I was going to have to somehow compensate for that. And most people just didn't want to come in the first place anyways. And the great irony of all of this is that these reforms that we embraced starting in the 1960s, we were told that we were doing this in order to make the church more welcoming and more attractive and more accessible. But here's one example of how fallacious and foolish that sentiment is. Um, People travel from all over the world to visit great European Gothic cathedrals, which are part, which are uniquely Catholic, which originate in the Catholic culture, which are classical and which transcend fashions and treads and whatever we might say appeals to the culture of today. It's so appealing that people will fly from continents over the oceans just to come and see these sites, just to sit in them for 15, 20 minutes at a time. That's how appealing authentic Catholicism is and its expressions. That's the potential that the Catholic Church could have to attract people in. We discarded that and embraced new sensibilities, new reforms, new cultural expressions that not only do not have people flying from all over the world to come see and experience, 
But even the people who are local to it avoid like it's just it's joining the nerdiest club that you could at school where you would just be seen as a complete social outcast. And for those of us that do our best to try to invite people in to this community and this way of life, uh, we find ourselves with a culture and a church that has set things up in such a way that, um, that inhibits the ability to do so. So what I'm trying to say, if I can circle back to this, this time of contemplation and the things that I was thinking about was, um, maybe I don't deserve beautiful liturgy, but I care deeply about a church that is welcoming and that is inclusive to as many people as possible. And what we have become is a church that claims to be welcoming and claims that that's what inspires all the things that we've been doing, but is in fact only appealing to a very, very narrow group of people, which is basically a subset of boomers from the 70s and 80s who thought this is like hymns from the 60s and 70s, the four hymn sandwich format of the liturgy with with tambourines and percussion style piano is what's going to attract people from the outside culture. It doesn't. It does not have broad appeal. I'm sorry. It's not welcoming. It's very unwelcoming. And so in all of our efforts to welcome people who just don't want to be welcomed, we've also marginalized the people who were already attached to the Catholic faith. We've seen a hemorrhage of people leaving the church since the 1960s, all over the place, universally. I know correlation doesn't equal causation. Maybe there are other reasons for that that we can point to. But that doesn't escape us from, from having to admit that whatever it was that we thought was going to happen, it hasn't happened. And we have been unsuccessful in welcoming in people from the outside. There haven't been streams of new converts. There's only been streams of ex-Catholics leaving out the back door. And so, as I consider this, maybe it's true that I don't deserve beautiful liturgy. But the reason I care so much about beautiful liturgy, beautiful architecture, beautiful design, beautiful culture, is because that is what will make Catholicism attractive to those who are currently not Catholic. In other words, welcoming to them. It will include them in a way that our current format and its ex exclusivity doesn't. And so at least as far as that fight is concerned, I will carry on. I will con continue to, s to explore the possibility that I'm the crazy guy when I find myself in the a very small minority. But insofar as liturgy and Catholic culture is concerned, I'm going to continue to fight for that. Because I just don't see how what we're doing now is welcoming. In fact, it's the opposite. And I think we need to stop congratulating ourselves for making these kinds of maneuvers in the name of welcome because it's having the opposite effect. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca. Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company, whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.